All right, good morning. I'm just trying to make sure our recording here is uh, started okay and the audio is working. Um, who wouldn't mind just uh, in the um, chat window if you could just put a yes or no if you can if you can hear us. All right, looks like we're good to go. Um, it's been quite an exciting week uh, out in the um, uh, the technology world. I don't know if you guys have been uh, paying attention to any of it, but <clears throat> but I certainly have. I'm a bit of a techno geek myself, and uh, looking at the whole Windows um, Windows 8 launch, the Windows 8 phones. Uh, of course, Apple's got a bunch of stuff going. I know this has nothing really to do with our product, but but uh, I just thought uh, it'd be a little interesting little topic to uh, just to mention. Um, with all these touch interfaces and, and touch devices out there, um, you know, um, I just wanted to know from you guys, um, you know, what, how do you see touch, uh, if if at all, um, integrating with your trading regimen or your trading software in any way? Um, you know, if you got any ideas, and you know, certainly, um, you know, I don't really have any uh, myself. I'm just just kind of curious, but. Uh, what you guys are thinking, um, you know, just feel free to mention it, share it in the uh, the chat there, and, and um, we'll see if we can share with the the rest of the uh, the audience as, as we're going along. Here. Um, you know, but I'd be I'd be interested to hear say, and uh, and and of course, then uh, you know, if there's uh, some great ideas there, then maybe uh, you know, who knows, we might uh, we might try a couple things out. Um, but uh, from my understanding, I saw the vast majority of traders, and, and of course, Ninja Trader is not really touch uh, capable, so um, it doesn't really have a kind of um, influence in that that area yet. But uh, who knows? I mean, um, it, it, there might be uh, some some great applications there that we're not exploring. Um, I could be taken advantage of. So uh, I'm just actually curious. How many of you guys uh, actually uh, did the upgrade to Windows 8? Um, uh, I did over the the weekend, yeah, also not the weekend, yeah, when did they launch? Just as soon as they launched, pretty much. I'm one of those first adopter type of people, so um, I went ahead and did it. And, uh, of course, everything works quite nicely. An integrator works uh, just fine in, in Windows 8. And essentially, it's, if, you're, if you haven't used it, it's really just, uh, uh, for, for most of us that are, are kind of desktop users of Windows, it's really just a... Um, fancy start screen that replaces the start menu but the desktop is basically the same um, and for software vendors like ourselves and even IndoTrader uh, I guess the big difference is that they now have a Windows Store which allows discoverability of, you know a little easier for, for, for developers like ourselves um, but because we're such a niche product uh, and and naturally I would, I would assume you know I, I would classified ninja trader and pretty much all the trading software out there is pretty niche as well um, you know it's I kind of wonder if they even have a place really in, in, in the Windows Store um, you know I certainly haven't talked to ninja trader themselves to see if they had any sort of uh, Windows 8 strategy or any, any Windows 8 specific strategy um, but again I'm curious to know if uh, those of you guys have been using Bloodhound for a little while or trading with ninja trader if you have any thoughts on the matter be kind of open to hear them and and uh, you know I'd love to hear your opinions um, yeah, so it looks like Rand, Randy says he's he set up Windows 8 on a separate system and and he's uh, familiarizing himself with it. You know, that's what I did for a while. I was actually on the, the consumer preview for, for, for many months. And uh, I'll be honest, the first taste I had of Windows 8, I couldn't figure anything out and I was frustrated and I said, ah, I never want to upgrade to this. Um, but uh, this is, you know, months ago, probably about half a year ago. And then uh, when they, when they released their very, very first consumer preview, it was pretty rough stuff that they had there. Um, actually, no, that was probably a year ago, really. Um, and since then, they polished it up quite a bit. But like I said, it's really just like Windows 7, just with a fancy start screen, really. And, you know, I mean, I mean for us, at least. Uh, but uh, for the rest of the world, it it's introduces a lot of touch interface. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean... Uh, uh, how many of you uh, actually trade uh, on a laptop or remotely or, I guess, away from a desktop computer, um, you know, or even, you know, even a tablet? Um, you know, if that's the case, uh, you know, as a private touch interface, you, you, you might actually benefit from it. But, uh, um, 
you know, I'd be kind of curious to hear what you what you have to say. So, anyways, if if you have any opinions, go ahead and share them in, in the chat there, and you know, I'll kind of be monitoring it, monitoring it, and reading them throughout the presentation here. I would say presentation. Today's a workshop. Um, it's most of you guys are pretty much uh, uh, familiar with the drill, but you know, this is our weekly web webinar, and and uh, of course, your your questions take precedence. Um, by the way, this is something we, we, we did a while back with uh, with Bob, actually, Bob Roisk, uh, that's that's here today, and, and we actually had him uh, on a mic once and, and uh, shared his, he, had, he shared his questions uh, using an audio format. Um, the, one of the limitations, unfortunately, that we have with uh, uh, GoToMeeting is that uh, whenever you type something into the chat, it only goes to us, we, we have to explicitly you know, click on it, respond to it, and say send to all for for it to so, sort of show up for everybody. Um, and so you guys can't really see what each other is is. Uh, <laughs> Daryl, sorry, I just saw what Daryl type. Daryl said he's got seven thirty inch screens. Wow, that's that's amazing, Daryl. Jeez, <laughs> I thought I had a, uh, I thought I was excessive with two twenty seven inches, but geez, seven thirty inch screen. That's probably uh, that's probably nearing a world record or something. Um, Anyway, <laughs> what, what I was getting at is if you have a microphone and, and you don't mind uh, sharing your question uh, on the mic, you know, like just let us know. That would be great because, you know, that, that also lets everybody else hear what you have to say and, and what you're asking. Um, and in particular, if we're recording, we're recording this as, as well, um, you know, it makes it a little easier for uh, someone who watches after the fact because uh, the, ch the chat transcript isn't uh, reflected in, in the recording. Um, you know to understand what's going on. So, yeah, let us know if you got a mic, um, and if you'd like to uh, to ask us uh, on the air rather than type it in. Uh, you know, actually, we'd prefer that, and that'd be great. Um, and uh, um, in the meantime, if you have a question, Zach will probably just you know, just repeat it uh, when he reads it there. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Randy. Randy says the the Metro UI or the modern UI, whatever they're calling it these days. I know they have some sort of legal issue with that, but uh, <laughs> um, you know it's probably going to become more commonplace. And Microsoft certainly has. Uh, I've been sort of diving into their tool sets there, and they've they've got all these uh, new Metro GUI uh, tools and, and whatnot. It's um, quite a departure from the traditional Windows, um, you know, the the icons and buttons and whatnot. So um, I expect uh, just just like Randy. Uh, stuff will evolve over time and, and sort of gradually go in that direction but it's uh, to be honest right now it's uh, it's hard for me to sort of imagine that with like kind of what I call very like professional level apps applications like you know like Ninja Trader or you know like Adobe Photoshop or you know um, I know Office has gotten us some sort of touch friendly interface now but uh, uh, you know I'm just I, I'm I guess I, I'd ha I'd have to sort of see it to believe it, um, to see how, how something like a, a, a very um, information heavy, you know, hardcore trading application uh, could somehow be uh, very touch front friendly without losing too much power, without losing power at all actually, I would have to say, like there's no point in doing it without, with, uh, if, you, if you're going to lose capability. Um, but I'm sure someone out there will try it and, uh, you know, we'll, uh, you know, I'd like to, uh, um, Sort of keep up with the times, and, and as long as it, again it doesn't uh, uh, rub anybody the wrong way, you know, like adding features. And, and I mean, let me preface this: you can never sort of please everybody at once, but um, you know, we always, we always want to strive to to make the software as uh, uh, not as as uh, intuitive as possible, modern as possible, and as powerful as possible. Uh, so you know, I tend to like to, 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 to see it, to, to see everything, try to stay on the bleeding edge. Um, I guess that's just the way the way I am and the way we you know the philosophy we have here. So, um, Daryl mentions that incidentally, Windows 8 supposedly has better multi-monitor support. Can you speak to that? I've no yet have yet to upgrade and with no immediate plans to do so. Uh, Daryl, I did try uh, multiple monitors with, uh, with the Windows 8 Consumer Preview. Um, to be honest, I found it a little bit uh, strange trying to like because right now if you want to you want to hit the Start menu. Um, you got to put your mouse in the kind of bottom left corner. Um, that's how you open the start menu. Uh, and it's kind of weird doing that. It kind of like if you imagine you have your multiple monitors and you're just kind of like, you know, if you're not on the edge and you're just kind of like on the, 
in the middle of a monitor and, and, you, and you're, you're trying to find that, put your mouse in that right spot to, to, to make that happen. I found it a little clumsy. Um, I know that Microsoft had, had made some changes to improve that. So uh, my computer at home doesn't have multiple monitors, and that's the one I have on Windows 8. So I, I kind of actually speak to that. I do plan to upgrade my work computer um, to Windows 8, which is multiple monitors. Um, and I'll certainly let you know how that, that works out. But, uh, um, you know, I, I actually found that uh, uh, the keyboard shortcuts were ultimately the quickest way to get around. Um, and uh, I guess if you're a power user, which, Daryl, it certainly sounds like you are, I mean, you'll probably be using keyboard shortcuts anyway. So, um, but I, I actually did fool around. With this. Again, I'm sorry if I've gone off a little topic, but this is just, you know, this is a lot of fantastic stuff going out, uh, happening out there in the industry in general. Computing. And, um, you know, I did try a couple tablets out, and, and uh, there's even an application, an, an app for my iPad that I can use to uh, to log into my uh, to remote desktop into my home computer. It basically simulates a Windows 8 laptop with my iPad. Um, and uh, I have to say, the Windows 8 interface on, on, on a touch tablet is just really slick. Uh, and uh, Tablet computing is, is fantastic. I mean, obviously, not maybe not for our industry, but uh, for just about any other application. Um, so it's it is pretty exciting. I, I like that stuff. Um, okay. Anyway, let's see. Going back to uh, I had to add it to a separate HVAC unit to cool them all. Oh my God, <laughs> Derek, jeez. Uh, you know, you got you got to send a a picture of your setup. That's a, that's incredible. <laughs> 30 or 7 30 inch screens on a uh, separate HVAC system. That's insane. Anyway, I, yeah, that's uh, I know I know traders uh, probably have the most screens uh, of probably any industry, but uh, that's that's crazy. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, oh yeah, Randy just sort of mentioned tablets with attachable keyboards covers to replace laptops. Yeah, I think that's kind of the idea. Yeah, for sure. The, uh, the, the that Microsoft Surface looks pretty slick. I definitely want to pick one of those up eventually. Uh, except that, just be aware, guys. If you're if you're thinking about getting one, the, the the current version out there is just Windows RT, which is not Windows. Like it's not the full blown Windows. So it definitely will not run Ninja Trader. Definitely will not run our software. Um, you need Windows. Well, I guess they're calling it Windows 8 Pro, or I'm not sure what the heck they call it. But uh, anyways, the the Winter Surface Pro tablet is basically a full-blown Windows machine. Um, their RT tablet uh, it, it is not compatible with with Ninja Trader or, or in, in the file extension that would that include our software. So yeah, Windows Pro I think that's what they... I, it's weird, I'm, I'm not sure. They, they have a Windows 8 Home version and then Windows 8 Pro and then they've got the tablets they call it Surface RT and then Surface Pro, and I think they actually don't mean the same thing, the Pro. Um, anyway, that's uh, that's not our problem, that's Microsoft's. So, um, back on topic, uh, we're, we've, uh, I think we're about a week and a half now into alpha testing 1.1. I uh, got some great feedback from some of you guys. Um, I'm working through it right now, I apologize if I, if I take a little longer than expected to get back to you, just, just got a lot of stuff to go through. Um, but, uh, you know, I am uh, definitely reading all your comments and whatnot. And if you haven't sent them in, I'd be, you know, again, really, really happy to hear from you. Um, you know, we, we, um, you know, we're getting closer and closer to, I think, what we, we, we get to a public beta stage, uh, where it's, uh, you know, I haven't seen any sort of glaring showstoppers in there yet. Um, you know, and so I think, it, you know, we, we, we're getting closer again to, uh, to, to be able to release this to a general public. Uh, just in a beta stage, and um, you know, and then, and then of course, we'll, at some point, we'll roll it out as the actual product itself. Um, just one minor thing to sort of be aware of: uh, we are looking into a more sophisticated uh, uh, licensing um, management uh, backend uh, that hopefully make your lives a little easier. Because right now, some of you that have to, uh, if you, if you want to move your your um, it, those of you that bought Bloodhound realize, know that we've got basically you're allowed two activations uh, with your computers, or two sorry, two different computers uh, that you're allowed to activate. Um, and if you ever need to change them up with us, that you just have to email us, 
and then say, oh, I'd like to, uh, you know, have this other computer activate. Please decide, deactivate the uh, the previous one that I had. Um, you know, which uh, you know, I realized that because it requires a little bit of human inter intervention from our par our part. Um, you know, there's a bit of a time lag. So you know, say you're traveling, you want to get a, you want to get blood have working on your laptop, um, but uh, you're not able to because we didn't get back to you within an hour or whatever. Um, so, anyways, we're again we're looking into a little more sophisticated uh, licensing management system um, that allow you to just kind of log into a to a back end and uh, automatically or well, not automatically, just yeah, just specify. Hey, I want this computer activated when you when you run Bloodhound, and um, it'll just work. Uh, and, and likely it'll be a kind of a login uh, password type system uh, uh, tied into the, the website account, um, which we're going to be cleaning up <laughs> to make that a little bit a uh, little bit tighter. Um, but anyways, that's just kind of on the horizon, and and uh, we're shooting for having that into 1.1, 1 .1, um, which isn't in the alpha. Um, but uh, we'll be we'll be sort of uh, making sure uh, that at least in the beta, so that uh, those of you that have purchased Bloodhound can can test out and make sure it's okay. Um, uh, Randy, Randy, so this is again off topic, but Randy's asking: Surface is it is just their hardware tech, right? That's correct. Their Surface. This is Windows again. We're talking about this is a little off topic, but Windows is their uh, Surface is the Microsoft's uh, new tablet uh, device that they've got going on. So. It's, I guess you know, designed to compete directly with those Android tablets and, and uh, Apple's iPad, whatever. Um, anyway, uh, I think I've sort of taken up enough time on sort of non um, uh, non business type uh, related stuff. But uh, I mean, uh, again, there's just a lot of crazy, exciting stuff going out there with with a lot of different uh, companies fighting for market share. Uh, on the mobile platform, on, on on the PC platform, so um, you know I'm just and we're just trying to figure out you know what kind of strategy and where where to go, uh, what direction to take, uh, if any, uh, it, um, you know, kind of with uh, with all this new stuff going on. So um, I'm going to pass it over to Zach, uh, who again this is again the same format. Uh, if you have any questions, just go ahead and ask them, and uh, they'll take precedence over anything else. Otherwise, uh, Zach has a uh, some stuff that uh, that he'd be willing to show you as well, and um, uh, maybe what he'll do is uh, just before we start here, ask I'll have him ask you guys kind of like how many of you guys are veterans and how many of you guys are new to Bloodhound, so we get a, a uh, an idea of kind of where what level of um, of, of uh, expertise to put this uh, presentation at. So I'm going to pass over to Zach right now, and if you're ready, Zach, uh, you can go ahead. Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, just, I guess, pass me the baton. There we go. Just a minute, guys, while this switches over. And yeah, and here, here's the poll Jeremy mentioned. Um, I see a couple of names I don't recognize, so I'm just going to put this poll up. <clears throat> And, oh, wrong one. Uh, let's see. There we go. There's the poll. So if you guys wouldn't mind answering that, I appreciate it. And while you're doing that, uh, Randy had commented, uh, two licenses issued and only one able to active at the same time would be great. Well, Randy, actually, we offer... Um, uh, two licenses uh, per purchase. So, uh, at, well, not two licenses, but we allow you to um, activate your you know, main trading computer uh, plus a backup computer. So they're both licensed at the same time, you know. So, uh, you know, we believe that you should always have a, a backup computer. Uh, so, you know, if you're trading live, you uh, you definitely have to have a backup computer and because as you guys have I'm sure you guys have all had your computers crash and you know you definitely can't have that right in the middle of a trade so if you have a laptop or whatever your backup computer is you can license that computer as well uh, with Bloodhound just send in your your second um, 
machine ID on your backup computer, and we'll get that license as well. So what Jeremy was talking about is that if you're on the road um, and for some reason you need to deactivate your your main desktop at home, um, and we'll say like your backup computer is a desktop as well, but you have a laptop you want to travel with, well you can deactivate one of your desktops and activate your laptop um, uh, while you're traveling or, or something like that. So. Um, Anyways, all right, so let me, uh, good, a lot of you guys are experienced, uh, looks like uh, we have uh, a new guest with us who's fairly new to Ninja Trader and Bloodhound, so whoever that is, welcome, and uh, let me close this up and we'll get things started. Um, <clears throat> all right, well, for a couple of the new people here, let me show you some uh, tech support resources for Bloodhound. So uh, I have a Skype account here, and I better turn myself off. Um, so if you guys are using Skype, um, I use this Skype account here, Zach White SI. Uh, so if you see me online on the Skype account, that means I'm available for you know instant uh, support. Uh, any questions or support you might need with Bloodhound, just feel free to chat me up and we can get a, a session going instantly. Um, and also on the website, let me bring that up here. <clears throat> so on our website, you can go to the support and the contact us page and if you have uh, support questions, you can use this form here, and that'll send in a, a ticket to both Jeremy and I, so we can both see it. And if uh, if you need some one-on-one -on -one support, then you can use the book an appointment, and that will book an appointment with me, and we'll do a one-on-one -on -one session, and I'll use the go-to meeting. Uh, we can do a, a remote session and we can work on your computer and help you out with your trouble or uh, help you get started. So um, a lot of times I usually I use a lot of times people who are new to Bloodhound um, book an appointment with me just so I can kind of help them get started, uh, help them over that you know initial hurdle. So um, some other support uh, Areas. If you go to Bloodhound here again, yeah. you're in Bloodhound. Yeah, exactly. Bloodhound. So we have the doc. So sorry to interrupt. Jeremy, uh, it looks like, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. It looks like your screen's not showing. Oh. oh. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. Oh, there we go. Oh. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh. I thought when I turned the poll off, it was going to start projecting again. So is my screen up, you guys? Okay, great. Thanks, Gary. All right, let me back it up here. So back to Skype, uh, so you guys can see my Skype name here, Zach White SI. Just to show you that once again. And back to Bloodhound. So um, from the Shark Indicators website, what I did is I went to support and then down at the bottom, the Contact Us page. So that's what this page is here. And down here is the form where you can submit your questions to us. All right, so you can put a subject up here. And down there, you can um, type in your question. And the green button over here is to book an appointment with me. Um, if you need some help getting started or uh, if you need some help um, solving uh, how to you know implement uh, a part of your system or something like that and see some of the other areas I've shown you is if you go to Bloodhound and then down to learn Bloodhound basically all of this is all of our uh, kind of training material so there's the actual documentation on all the components of Bloodhound so like the solvers the logic nodes um, 
things like uh, let's see the, the interface and whatnot. So a best place to start if you're brand new to Bloodhound, uh, the video tutorial section is really where you want to start. Uh, that gives you, you know, the introduction and the basics of Bloodhound. Um, and then there's a few tutorials on some of the solvers um, and the logic nodes. And then uh, once you kind of get going down the tips and tricks section, uh, these were pretty much some commonly asked uh, questions that I've turned into videos. Um, one of these videos is to help you figure out if your custom indicator or a third-party indicator will work with Bloodhound. Um, and then all of these workshops uh, are being recorded. So you can find all the recorded workshops in the training workshops section right here. And this download section, uh, anything that's available for download off the website, it's all centralized in this on this one page here. Uh, so like for example, if I go to the tips and tricks, there are some download templates like right here. Uh, so this tips and tricks on using the CCI. You can see there's a download button here. One's for the Bloodhound template and the other one's for the Ninja Trader chart, chart template. So these download files, those type of download files are all available in this download page. So, all right, with that, let's uh, get started here. And uh, it's going to check the questions. Um, Yeah, Randy's saying we're getting into the holiday seasons, lots of tech stuff coming out. So, you know, this is definitely the best time of year to um, buy any computer equipment that you've been wanting. So you can definitely get the best deals for around Christmas. That's usually when I do all my upgrades to my computer. Uh, so, um, all right, so Rick is one of the new guys. Welcome, Rick. Okay, so um, for for a couple of new new guys here in the room, um, uh, we're starting halfway into a signal that I started uh, last week. Uh, so what what this signal what uh, I guess what this workshop is about is really kind of um, showing you guys how to take what you're seeing on the chart and break it down into the individual uh, components, individual pieces of data that you're seeing, how to break it down so that the computer can understand it or more directly how Bloodhound can understand it. Um, so I have a few simple kind of signals that uh, I've created and so these next upcoming workshops I'm going to be showing you guys how to build them, uh, how to build the signals, uh, but really this is about understanding how to break down what you're seeing on the chart and, and how to look at the uh, various uh, pieces of data that you're actually looking and seeing on the chart and understanding how to uh, tell the computer what you're seeing. So. Um, so with that, uh, we're kind of halfway through with this signal that I, that I started building. And as you can see, this, this signal is trying to detect uh, a bounce off of a moving average. Right? So the red line is a 55 period EMA. Uh, so we're trying to detect when price bounces off of that EMA. And part of, uh, and so we're, what we're what we left off with last week was building some filters uh, so that way let me kind of scroll back here here we go so um, quite often when you find a moving average uh, period that kind of um, 
seems to be good for creating a resistance point where that price likes to bounce off of, such as you're seeing here and kind of over here. Uh, quite often, price also likes to consolidate around that moving average as well. And so obviously, uh, you don't want any signals here while price is consolidating around and just kind of chopping around. So I used the white moving average to create some uh, filters or you know some some criteria so that we only get signals so that when price ha is moving towards the moving average. Right, so I, you can see by looking at the white uh, moving average line, you know we're looking for that shorter period moving average. So the, the white line is a nine period uh, zero lag EMA. And actually, just recently, that's right. Just recently, before I started this, I actually switched it over to an HMA. So last week I was actually using a zero lag EMA. And just this morning, I noticed uh, the HMA provides a little bit of a smoother um, moving average. It runs a little smoother than, than uh, the zero lag EMA. So I switched it over, and I'll show you guys how to easily switch that over in Bloodhound. Uh, so back to my point, um, you know, part of what we're seeing when we're getting a bounce, right, is we're seeing this short period moving average, we're, we're seeing the moving average move towards the red moving average or uh, our, our main moving average that we're looking for a bounce off of. So that's where we ended things last week is setting up the white moving average um, as part of, part of our rules for this, this bounce off of the red moving average. So, with that, let me, um, all right, well, another, I guess, quick introduction for the new people. So once you get Bloodhound installed, if you, uh, the way you add Bloodhound to your chart is Bloodhound is an indicator. So you just need to bring up your indicator panel. And the Bloodhound, uh, Bloodhound itself and a couple of indicators that are included with Bloodhound are down in the S's. So if you jump down to the S's and they're under SI. So you'll see the first SI um, indicator is SI Bloodhound. Uh, SI standing for shark indicators. And SI Chameleon is one of the indicators that we've included with Bloodhound. Uh, what SI Chameleon does is it allows you to feed price data such as, um, let me just jump this on here quick. So you can add like um, the high price, the low price, median, midpoint, open, you know, and such. It allows you to feed these uh, price points into Bloodhound. Uh, but also it has a very powerful feature over here. So if we use the uh, use alternate instrument or time frame, if I set that to true, you can see I can actually use this indicator to feed in data from another instrument. Um, that could even be from one of the exchange, um, what are they called? Uh, um, can't think of the correct terminology, but like the tick um, that comes from, a, I see, I believe the tick is from the NICE um, and other, other uh, types of market data, you know, you could feed that into your system. Uh, or if you're pairs trading, right, you could compare another uh, uh, another currency. Um, and, or you can just, you know, uh, so what I'm working on is the 6E, the Euro, and so I could just uh, feed price data from, you know, let's say the 15 minute uh, 6E price data as well. You know. Let's see, and some of the other um, 
you're going to see some stuff on my chart that you won't see on yours because I have a, a debug version. Um, let's see, there is the SI swings. Um, so that's another indicator. And um, we do have uh, some previous workshops that kind of explain these indicators. And we have SI swings high low as well. So uh, essentially all Bloodhound's um, com indicators are under SI. Um, all right, so the point where it's, where it's at is, you know, just add, uh, this is how you add Bloodhound down onto your chart, like so. Hit OK. And when you do that, um, you'll see a button pop up on the top of your chart and this pull-down menu as well. So if you click on the button, that will open up Bloodhound's interface. So let's see, we started this, uh, we started this signal last week. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, rename this for this week. You can see I have the date on here. So if I want to rename this, um, essentially this is kind of like doing a save as. I'll hit the change button. And I'm going to click on the name I'm using. And then I can just edit the name. And uh, happy Halloween, guys. All right. Hit save. And now we can see there the name, the name of our template has changed, and the name up on the button has changed as well. All right. So starting from last week. All right. So I haven't gotten into the logic tab yet. Um, so I've just been working setting up my solvers. Um, so this solver here. Let me turn them all off. So this solver here is the one that's uh, kind of like the main component of the signal. And so what that is doing is it's looking, um, it's looking for price. And I'm using SI Chameleon to get the price data. Let me open that up. And so I'm using the low of the bar and the high of the bar. Uh, that's the two pieces of price that I'm looking at. And so like for here, all right, I'm looking for the high of the bar to be within certain number of ticks of the moving average uh, to get, uh, to get um, a confidence value out, out of this solver. So I'm looking for the high and the low to be within two ticks of the moving average. So you can see that whenever the higher or the low gets within two ticks, uh, I'm getting an output from Bloodhound when that occurs. Right? And so, I mean, just looking at this, you're going, okay, yeah, it looks like we're almost getting what we're wanting. We're getting a signal when price is coming to the moving average and bouncing away. Although if I scroll back, Obviously, you know, this doesn't work for us, so we need to add some more rules to this signal to filter out all this, all this stuff here. Um, so one of the rules that I added, pretty simple one, was the bar direction. So I wanted to wait, um, let me scroll back here. So I wanted to wait, we can see this, this black bar is moving down towards the moving average. And then this filled in bar is moving away from the moving average. So I wanted to at least get uh, a confirmation by having the bar move away from the moving average, uh, essentially kind of confirming the bounce off of the moving average. So I used the bar direction to do that. So if I turn on this solver, we can see some of these uh, areas here. Let's see. Right, so right here we can see it filtered out 
this signal coming out of Bloodhound. Let me mark it here. Um, yeah, this guy right here. So if I turn the bar direction off, we can see um, the low of this bar m must be within two ticks of the moving average, but price kind of broke through and it's continuing to move down. So adding the bar direction solver helped filter that one uh, signal out. And then these other solvers here are looking at the white moving average. So we're looking for this white moving average. Essentially what we're looking for is we're looking for price uh, to be you know, some, some distance away from our red moving average and we're looking for the price to be moving towards the moving average. Right? So that's kind of like the first criteria to have a bounce is you need price to be, you know, to have been pulled away um, some distance away from the moving average and then moving towards it. And so these filter, and so these, I'm sorry, solvers are looking at the slope. They're using the slope solver. Right, so they're using the slope solver to look at the slope of this white moving average. Oh. Uh, let's see, I see uh, Bruce wrote in a question there. Why not price touches MA then close greater than open criteria? Um, let's see, why not price touches the uh, moving average? Uh, okay, well, so Bruce, I'm thinking that you're probably asking about this, um, the first solver here, which is kind of like, a, essentially this one solver is essentially the main signal generator, and then all the rest of the solvers are kind of like adding rules to kind of filter out um, all this garbage that you could get here. So um, I'm not necessarily looking for price to touch the moving average because uh, the markets never move um, in exact measurements. You know, uh, the markets are very random, um, and so you kind of have to give some allowance for that randomness of the market within your system. If you're too precise, uh, you'll you'll end up filtering out um, a lot of signals. Um, like, for example, this. You know, you could uh, you can look at this and you can see, yeah, you know, well, yeah, that basically was price trying to get as close as it could to the moving average, and then it bounced off of it, and we missed this signal here, or, or not signal, but we missed this bounce, um, probably just because it was just a few an extra tick away. Um, looks like it was three ticks away, you know, maybe three, three and a half ticks away, and so. You know, we missed this potential trade here just because I was specifying two ticks um, instead of three ticks. You know, so these are subjective calls. Now, as far as um, the close being greater than the open, um, essentially that's what the bar direction is doing for me, uh, all in one solver. So, um, so I hope I kind of answered your question there, Bruce. Thanks. Um, all right, so let me kind of uh, back to these slope solvers here. And so the way I've set them up is each of these solvers is, is looking back um, a particular number of bars. So there's one DS in the name that I put here is this one is a DS displacement. So I set this displacement to one, which essentially what that does is it kind of looks back one bar. So if we're on, 
um, this bar here. So if this is the current bar, using this displacement essentially is looking back to the previous bar. So it's looking to this bar here. And so I'm looking at the slope of this white moving average. I'm looking back one bar is what I'm doing with this solver. So if I turn that on and let's see if that helps filter. There we go. Um, so by turning this solver on, it, it filtered out this short signal that was right here. Right, so this short signal here was filtered out. And let's start looking at this area of consolidation. There we go. Let me turn that solver back off. So we can see we have quite a few signals going on here. And just by having one of these, it filtered out a lot of them. But we're still getting a bunch of false signals. So what I did is I added a few more. So this next solver down, it has a displacement of two. All right, so I'm looking back two bars. And it filtered out even more, uh, more of these uh, false signals. Um, and of course, if you've been doing this for any time, you always know there's always going to be some uh, false positives in your system. Um, and so this is definitely, this long signal here is definitely going to be one of them. Um, I mean, if you're looking at this, you know, price is definitely, you know, pulled off of this moving average um, and then has a good move towards the moving average and you, know, you never know if price is going to bounce off of it or not and, and until a few more bars go by. Um, and let's see what happens if I add this third, um, this third displacement solver here. Uh, let's see, I even filtered this long off. I have a feeling that's going to be filtering out too many trades though. Let's take a look. No, it's not affecting any of these right here. Um, so, all right, I'll just leave it on. Um, but as I made note, at the beginning, I switched over, I switched this white moving average over to an HMA. And you can see on the name, um, originally I started with the zero lag EMA. So let me switch these over real quick. All right, so we're using a nine HMA. And So switching over to a 9 HMA is that simple. So let me get these other two switched over real quick here. And um, you know, I think I'd mentioned this a couple of weeks back, but something really exciting that we're hoping to implement. And Jeremy and I kind of tossed this back and forth, and it looks like we're going to be able to plot. The, uh, don't look for this anytime soon. This is probably going to take some work, but it looks like we're going to be able to plot the indicators that you're that you have that you're using in Bloodhound 
that we're going to be able to plot them on the chart. So you won't have to manually add your indicators on the chart. You can just put your indicators, you know, whatever indicator is being used in your bloodhound signal, I think we might be able to plot them on the chart. So that would be a really cool convenience to have. Uh, okay, so I am all switched over to the HMA. Uh, and uh, let's see. Um, just looking at things uh, real quick here for a moment. All right, um, so the next step is going to be put is to put this all together in um, in the logic node. Uh, it's just going to create a cleaner look. So you, if you look in Bloodhound's output down here, you can see we're, you know, we have this nice uh, wavy looking analog type of output. And we can clean this up um, and give it a cleaner look like this. So this chart here has the finished uh, product on it. So on this chart, um, this has the actual original signal that I created. And this is what we're trying to recreate and build. Right? So yeah, we have this nice, clean, uh, digital type output. So it's either the signal is on or off. And the way we got that is by using the logic nodes. They're using the AND logic nodes. And let's see. Unfortunately, yeah, this signal here did we did get a bunch of false positives on um, in this choppy zone? Let's take a look at this over here. Um, yeah, this did a better job of cleaning those out. I think the reason why is on this signal, I only have one, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I only have two of these um, slope solvers on here. And whereas this one, I have three. So I think that may be part of the, the difference. Um, and there's an there's an extra solver on here um, that I'm going to add later on that might have been causing this. So we'll take a look at that when we when we get to it. Um, all right. So, but for now, let's just uh, take what we have and put it into a logic template. So I'm going to create a new logic template. And let's see, I'll just call it my, uh, my entries. Just open up the work area here a little bit. All right, so first thing I usually do is just um, start adding my solvers onto the system or onto the logic board. Uh, I typically refer to this green work area as the logic board. Kind of like goes back to the old days. Uh, originally, I had planned to go into electronics. All right, so back in the old days, you'd take your electronic components and you'd solder them onto a, a circuit board. Um, so it's kind of where I got the logic board term from. All right, so here's my various solvers, and I just need to throw a AND node on here. Plug that in, and just start connecting all my solvers. I 
There we go. Now we have a nice clean look. Uh, let's just check the questions here real quick. Uh, so. All right, so um, one of the other things that I had um, added on the original signal, let me bring up that chart. Uh, so on this original signal, one of the other uh, solvers I added um, was I added an, an additional solver here that's looking at the price, the one that's looking at the price. I added one uh, to look at the closing price. So this solver here, which is using SI Chameleon, as I showed you earlier, is looking at the high and low. And I guess when I was building this, um, I was probably looking back and saw some instances where looking at the closing price um, was necessary to to um, to get uh, a signal fired so I wouldn't miss you know miss an opportunity so I wouldn't miss a trade let me see if I can find one of these instances on the chart I know you guys can't when I'm moving the chart it gets kind of blurry sorry about that I'm just going to scroll through here and see if I can find one of these situations. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Mm. Hmm. Oh, you know what is probably was to work with a different bar type. So right now I'm working with these range bars. So that really um, quite often uh, when you're working with range bars, you know the close um, and the open then is usually fairly close to the high and the low. Um, you know, unless you get like a hammer or a shooting star like this. Uh, so I probably added this extra solver to look at the closing price in case we were working on a minute chart or a tick chart or something like that where you could where you would get some longer longer wicks um, so I think what what I might have seen is something like where if uh, you had a wick that was really long, you know, broke through your moving average, really long, bounced back up, and so this, you know, the low was basically out of this two tick range that we're looking for, but the close of the next bar would be within range. Um, I wish I could find it for you because this, you know, visually seeing this stuff makes it far easier to understand. Um, yeah, I'm just not seeing it on the range chart here. Um, but let me uh, let me add this on. Just add this to it, anyways. So what I'm going to do, uh, essentially, this solver is set up the way that we want, except we just need to uh, switch the high and low that Chameleon is looking at to over to the closing price. So I'm going to head back to the solvers, and I'm going to select this solver here and just copy it, make a copy, and actually... I'm going to rename this guy. 
because this guy is looking at the high and the low. And this solver down here is going to be looking at the closing price. So let me just put the close in there. And I can use Chameleon to look at the closing price. Or um, I can just use the closing price here. And I'm just going to do it this way. It's a lot easier this way. Um, all right. So we have that. We got that solver ready. Now we'll just add it to the logic board. And essentially, uh, you're not going to get both both of these situations firing at the same time. Well, you would on a range bar. Uh, potentially, you well potentially you would on a range bar. Uh, but since it's, since um, I'm pretty sure I added this criteria in case we're working on a minute chart uh, or you might get a long wick. Um, and since we're essentially looking for, uh, let's see, yeah, how do I explain this? Um, so one of these criteria could be true and the other one not true. That's what we want to allow. We don't need both the closing price and the higher low to be true. So if I just plugged this new solver into the AND node, essentially both of these situations would have to be true uh, in order to get a signal. But we want to allow just one or the other or both. So to allow one or the other or both, so we have to join them together using an OR logic. So let me uh, pan around here, slide these out of the way. And then I can plug both of these into the OR node and then plug the OR node into the AND node. And yeah, so adding adding the closing price to our system, as we can see, added a lot of extra false positive signals here. Um, if I disconnect this guy. Yeah, we can see a lot of them go away. So um, I guess what this point kind of illustrates is uh, depending on the bar type you're using can definitely affect the way you want to set your signal up. So I guess let me go ahead and put this on a um, put this on a two-minute chart and we'll see what happens here. Um, Hmm. Looks like we should be getting a, a signal right here. So let's take a look at this and find out why we're not getting a, a signal there. Um, oh, I could tell you why. Um, No, I was thinking it was because of this the moving average, but actually, oh yeah, maybe it is the moving average here. Um, so we only we have one, two bars, two bars moving towards the red moving average, but the short moving average, um, we can see it's sloping down right here. So on this third bar away, it's actually sloping down. Uh, actually, on the second bar the moving average is sloping down. So it's sloping the wrong direction. That's probably why this didn't give us a signal. Um, but let's take a look at it and kind of do some troubleshooting. So that's another part of what you know these next few workshops coming up are about. 
you know, it's how to um, how to kind of uh, add your rules, how to you know convert your rules from what you're seeing on the chart, you know, into solvers, and also debugging the whole system as well. Um, you know, so we can clearly see this would be a great trade to take a, a short trade, you know, off of this bounce. Um, you know, so we want to find out why this signal is not working. So it's, you know, so debugging um, your system is also a part of what this series is going to be about as well. Uh, let's see. I see a comment here by Randy. Um, in the old days, you could physically plug logic. Oh, <laughs> you're talking about electronics. You can physically plug logic ICs directly into a logic board. Uh, yeah, yep, Randy. Yeah, so I, uh, I used to use those uh, logic boards as well, right? You just plug your components in and plug them, push them in, uh, yeah, into a logic board and pull them out and quickly test your design. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that's where I got the the name for this work area is, is a log, logic board. So, all right. So back on topic here. Um, let's try and uh, figure out why we're not getting a signal here. Um, and I think my first guess is going to be that these solvers here that are looking at the short period moving average, I think I have too many of them. So let's see what happens if I unplug one of these guys. And uh, nothing yet. And I'm trying to measure, see how many ticks away this is. Uh, change my chart up a little bit. So let's change this to a five tick grid. See what happens. Uh, let's go to a two tick grid. There we go. That's not so bad. Um, all right. So this, this is uh, these highs are definitely within two ticks of the moving average. Um, Hmm. Let's see what happens if I unplug, disconnect another uh, slope solver here. So, okay, that, that's what did it. So, what's occurring is um, the slope of this white MA um, it it's only it only started moving up towards the red moving average um, only for essentially two three bars so so that's what's happening hmm. because we're getting because kind of price kind of pulled back has this pullback right here um, and the moving average is move in the wrong direction that kind of filter out this signal. Um, so once again, you know, it's just the randomness in the market. Uh, building a system to try and conform, you know, to try and allow these good signals through, but at the same time cut out all the chop. Sometimes you even cut out a good signal. Um, so, um, hmm. So adding, let me do this again. Let me disconnect this guy. So we can see we've got three signals over here. Uh, as price kind of chops around, and so when I added, when I added one of these slot uh, slope solvers here, we can see it filtered out two of them. Um, you know, the one it fired on looked like a really good one, uh, but price wasn't done chopping around yet. Um, hmm. 
let's keep looking through here. Yeah. So this area right in here is kind of like the ideal, ideal signal. I'm going to mark this right here. You know, this is kind of the perfect situation right here. Um, price has moved away from the moving average, and it's got a, several bars where it's moving towards it, and then bounces right off. You know, that's it's kind of like the ideal situation that we're shooting for. Um, and here's another another good one over here. And luckily, there was enough. Um, luckily, there was enough bars in the moving average, or uh, in the MA, the white MA, moving towards the red moving average. Luckily, there was enough of those bars where we actually got a signal that worked out good. I imagine if I plugged in this third solver here, right, which is acting like a kind of filter to clean up, um, clean up our signals. If I plug this in. It's probably, yeah, it's, it's still firing there. Oh, good. Good. I thought it would have filtered it out. Uh, let's just take a look. Hmm. Well, a little bit of chop going on here. Hmm. And let's add the closing price and see what happens there. Hmm, let me disconnect this here. Hmm, interesting. So, look at uh, look at this guy right here. So this is not what we were looking for, but if I added the closing price in, we did. <laughs> that did end up being a good trade by chance. However, it definitely does not meet our uh, criteria. Uh, let's see. You know, if we're looking for a, a short trade, we definitely want price to be below the moving average. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, you know what? That's good that we found this. Uh, so let's create a filter here that looks for price being on the wrong side of the moving average, right? So if we're getting a short trade, essentially we, we want these guys here. And the difference is is um, you know price is on the bottom is uh, underneath the red moving average where we want it to get a short whereas here you can clearly see price is above the moving average price broke above so we don't want to short when price broke above the moving average even though this this particular case did turn out to be a good trade, but uh, you know this is really not what this signal is about. This signal is about getting a bounce off of the moving average. Um, so let's work on filtering this out here. Uh, all right, so how do we filter this out? Um, the clear and easiest way to look at this is you can see that. Uh, you know, hey, price, price is above the moving average. Um, and also the white moving average is above the red moving average. Uh, and, um, you know, most of you guys are uh, been doing this for a while, so you know that uh, moving averages are lagging indicators. So, what I'm thinking is I would rather use a lagging indicator because quite often, as we can see right here, price loves to you know break across our moving averages 
just a little bit. Um, you know, once again, this adding uh, randomness into the market. So what I'm what I'm thinking is that if I'm looking for price to be above the moving average, it might filter out uh, too many good trades. Um, but if I use you know something that's lagging, like the white moving average, um, right? We can see that price breaks above it, but the white moving average does not um, break above the red moving average. Let's kind of see if I can find some other situations like that. Um, let's see. Hmm. Well, we can see right here the moving average did break through the white one broke below the red moving average, so that may not be perfect. Um, hmm. But it still may work for the most part. Um, you know, these, these kind of things is kind of the reason why I don't really use minute charts anymore, uh, just because of the volatility. It's kind of why I like using uh, tick charts or range charts or rank goes. Uh, it just kind of smooths out price movement a little bit more. So, well, I guess uh, for the sake of this training session, let's just kind of work on, let's just kind of take a, a simpler approach for now and we'll just use the white moving average uh, to filter out um, when price breaks above the red moving average a little too much. All right. So what we're going to do is we're comparing the white moving average to the red one. All right. So for a short trade, we need the white moving average to be below the red one. And for a long trade over here, right, we need the white moving average to be above. Oh. So once again, so this is a comparison. So we're comparing the white line to the red line. So let's go over to the solvers. And I'll add a comparison on here. So let's see, I'm comparing the HMA9 to the EMA55. Yeah. All right, so let's plug those in here. Select the EMA and uh, so for the benefit uh, of a couple of new guys that we have in here, um, the way you add an indicator to the solver, um, you can either double click on the indicator that you want or you can use the add new button and that will add it down there. And then the next step is uh, to set, you know, set up your parameters um, for the indicator to make sure that they match what's on your chart. And then the third step is to go down here and select the plot that you want. So, for instance, um, the MACD, right, the MACD has three plots down here. So you need to select which plot that you're looking at that you want to use in your system. So the EMA is pretty simple. There's only one plot coming out of it. All right, so we have our HMA9 and our EMA55. Um, we're just, we don't need to set any kind of difference here. Um, 
just making sure that the HMA 9 is, you know, below the the EMA 55 by 0 ticks is good enough. And let's see. One thing that we're going to want to do is, uh, let's see here. So if, for a long, we want the white line, which is the HMA, to be above the EMA. So let's see. The HMA is indicator A. Right, the EMA is indicator B. So for a long signal, we want the HMA to be above the EMA, or we want A, A to be greater than B. So this is already so we so we can just use the default settings of this solver. And this works for us. Alright, so let's move over to the logic tab. Add that solver on. And we can easily test this. Let's plug this guy in here. And yep, yeah, there we go. It's working just like the way we want it. So we can see um, when the HMA gets above the EMA, right, we're getting a long signal, which would then block this short signal that we were getting here. So let's connect anode back up, and we'll just plug this into the anode, and voila, the signal now was filtered out. So, um, all right, that was fairly simple. Um, I see a comment coming in here by Randy, or a question maybe. Let me take a look at this. And uh, essentially, I'm going to try and wrap it up here, so it's almost 12 o'clock. Uh, so if you guys got any questions, um, feel free to ask them now. I'll try and get through all your questions before we wrap this up. Uh, so Randy's commenting, there will always be gray areas uh, to filter out. Yep, definitely, Randy. Um, you know. Uh, markets are very random and so essentially the, the best we can do is try and find um, consistent patterns that give us uh, an edge uh, on the odds you know that's what we're looking for is you know so essentially this moving average or this you know price bounce off of the moving average is essentially a, a reoccurring pattern uh, that seems to give us an edge um, and so if we can, you know, program this pattern in um, and program it in to work consistently in our favor, you know, that's uh, essentially, you know, um, kind of the best we can do um, to put, you know, the, the patterns that have a slightly higher odds of winning you know, in our favor, um, just to uh, what essentially, yeah, increase the the odds in our favor uh, when you're working with a, a truly random um, situation. So, uh, he further goes on uh, to say, it's a uh, your best option is usually to backtest and journal your filter effects to the point that you are just filtering out more bad trades. Yep, than good ones. Definitely, exactly. Um, let's see more. Uh, yep, trying to filter out trending and chopping markets. Uh, if you attempt to filter out every bad trade uh, that you come across, you will filter out all the good trades. Yes, that's definitely true. Um, uh, you know, I've built a lot of systems and definitely when you get too too tight on your filtering when you create too much filtering you essentially wipe out um, all most uh, most of your good trades you know so right it's it's a matter of finding that balance between you know filtering out these uh, what we you know these potentially bad trades um, 
uh, filtering out more bad trades and leaving more of the good trades behind. All right, so you're just trying to find that, that balance and back testing is definitely a, a core component of that. Just don't get um, too carried away in filtering out too much. Um, so uh, essentially, you know, time and experience will teach you that. You know, that the more you filter out, the more you wipe out your good trades. Um, you know, that just kind of comes with, with experience of, of doing this. So, um, and hopefully I can help speed that learning process up as I do these workshops uh, with, with you guys. And, and, you know, one of the core um, benefits of Bloodhound is to help speed that process up as well. So, you know, originally Jeremy had written Bloodhound for us to, to use to help speed up our, our you know, si um, signal system generation. Um, that's kind of how Bloodhound was born. And uh, I got to say, it does its job very well. So, um, all right. Well, it doesn't look like there's very many questions from you guys. So, I guess thanks for joining us. And I know this is a pretty short workshop. And, uh, hey, I hope you, hope you're, uh, for those parents out there, I hope you guys have a safe Halloween. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Um,